Good afternoon. I am Michelle Visby, Child Nutrition Consultant with the Maine Department of Education Child Nutrition Program. Today we are going to be discussing common administrative review findings. We will discuss problems that we observe during the administrative review process and some tips and best practices to best prevent these findings. During today's webinar, all attendees have been placed on mute. This webinar is being recorded so you can view it at any time. Now, let's get started. Findings that occur during the review process are sorted into three different categories. We have performance standard one, performance standard two, um, and, and general. We have taken our list of common findings and we will be addressing them in this order throughout the webinar. So performance standard one. This is the first area we're going to look at. This can include anything in regards to certification and benefit issuance, verification, and meal counting and claiming. The common finding that we are gonna talk about in this area is incomplete application. We often find that applications have been that have been approved are actually incomplete. The problem areas with applications include missing adult signature, missing the last four digits of the social security number or indication of no social security number, and new this year is that pay frequency is not indicated. So here we have step four of our meal benefit applications. Um, this is where the adult signature needs to be, and this is required on all applications that you receive. The next section you see circled is the last four digits of the social security number. This is required on all applications except for SNAP, TANF, or FOSTER. Any other application must have the last four digits of that social security number or indication that they do not have one. New this year, um, because of the change that has been made to applications, um, approving officials need to make sure that whenever an earnings amount is indicated, they also need to indicate what that pay frequency is. Um, whenever any of these items are missing, it is important that you follow up with the family to get the application completed. If this is done over the phone, you need to make sure that you document the conversation, write down who you spoke with and when you spoke to them. Um, in regards specifically with pay frequency, I have also seen recently on some applications that they will put a hourly rate. In that case, it is still considered incomplete. That is not one of the frequencies that they can choose from. You cannot assume that they work 40 hours a week, so you would need to follow up to get clarifying information from that family. Performance standard two is the next area we are going to look at. This can include meal components and quantities and production records. We are gonna to touch on both of these topics when talking about common findings. Specifically, we're going to look at menu planning and production records. Menu planning is the foundation of ensuring that you are meeting the meal pattern. It is important that while you are planning your menus, you double check to make sure that every component and subgroup are being met. Having someone proofread your menus is a great way to be able to accomplish this. Accomplish this. It is important that you also remember that the red-orange vegetable subgroup needs to have a higher offering than the other groups. When it comes to menu planning, one of the most common problems we find is that a vegetable subgroup will be missed or will not be a available for an alternate meal choice. This can result in fiscal action during the administrative review process. Here we have an example of when an alternate meal choice might not have all the vegetable subgroups available to them. If you offer a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or sun butter and jelly um, every single day of the week, and one day you offer a combination meal of beans and hot dogs, that bean subgroup is not being offered to the children having the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. One way to correct this is to have some plain beans available for the students with the PB&J 
or offer another type of uh, another item from the legume subgroup at another time on your salad bar if you have one. Other items that this could happen with um, are shepherd's pie or chili, where they are a combination entree with your vegetable and meat meat alternate in one. Production records are your documentation that you are in fact meeting the meal pattern. It is required that production records are kept for the National School Lunch Program, School Breakfast Program, and After School Snack Service. During the administrative review process, we require schools to send us a week's worth of production records with recipes and labels. We then take the time to look at every production record to ensure that the meal pattern is being met. The most common errors that we are seeing on production records are milk is missing or does not reflect a variety, uh, reflect that a variety is being served. Incorrect serving sizes are recorded. Um, it is very important to know the difference between the serving size and the crediting information. For example, if you record that you have romaine lettuce on the menu and the serving size is a half a cup, we will only give you credit for a quarter of a cup serving. Um, leafy greens, credit for half of the amount of the serving size. And just, you know, in the opposite is any dried fruit. If you record that you have a quarter cup of dried fruit, you actually are going to receive a half a cup's worth of credit. Um, it is often that we will see the plan menu filled out on the production record, but the actual amounts produced, served, and left over are not filled out. It is required that production records are filled out completely. That way we can see um, that you're not running out of certain things. Um, we need to see that vegetable subgroups are available to all students throughout the meal service. Um, another fine, uh, thing that we see with production records is if you have a pre-K program. If your school offers a pre-K program and they do not eat with the other children, in the school, they are not what we consider to be commingled. If a pre-K program is not commingled, then it is required for their meals to follow the CACSP meal pattern. This must be documented either on your current production record or a separate production record to show that this meal pattern is being followed. Here is an example of a production record. We offer this same example on our website for anyone to download at any time. For every meal, the information at the top of the production record needs to be filled out. This is general information that we use to know which meal pattern we are looking at. The column on the left is where you need to list all items that are available for that particular meal service. This includes any a la carte items, um, your milk variety, and even condiments. This is where milk needs to be listed. And like stated before, you must show that you are offering at least two choices of milk, one of which must be unflavored. This can be done by either listing the two types of milk separately, or you can create a milk recipe that shows us how many of each type of milk go out for each meal service. If you choose to have a milk recipe, be sure to indicate so on the production record in the second column. The third column is where you would write your serving size. This needs to be clearly communicated and easy to understand. If you are serving a whole muscle chicken breast, you need to record the serving size of that piece of chicken in ounces. In the case of leafy greens, make sure you are recording the serving size and not the crediting size. The amount that is entered there for that item would be cut in half. In the three columns that are circled on the right side of the production record, that is where you will record the actual amount prepared, the amount left over, and the amount served. If this is not filled out, the production record is incomplete. We need to be able to verify that menu items are made available to all of the students participating in the program. If we are looking at the week of production records that are sent in for the administrative review and we see that one day that the one day that you serve a legume on the menu, you ran out and did not have enough for all students in the program to have access to the legume for that week, it would be a finding. So 
General area findings is the last category we are going to go through. The general area of the review covers a wide range of topics. This can include civil rights, on-site monitoring, wellness policy, smart snacks, professional standards, food safety, Buy American, record keeping and outreach. And because of that, it is where we will actually find a lot more of our review findings. The specific findings we are going to discuss today are wellness policy, professional standards, non-discrimination statement, meal charge policies, standard operating procedures and calibration logs, signage, FFVP, uh, FFVP claiming, and summer food service program outreach. So the first thing we're gonna look at is wellness policy. When looking at wellness policies, there are a few things that we look for, and there are some things that jump out to us very, fairly quickly. Um, has the wellness policy been assessed in the last three years? That is something we look for right at the very beginning. This is a requirement, and it needs to be documented on the wellness policy when its last assessment date was. Does your wellness policy reference policy EFE or your competitive food sales policy? If it does, we then have to look at that policy. And the con common finding here is that your competitive food sales policy tends to still reference Chapter 51. Chapter 51 no longer exists and has been completely replaced by the Smart Snack standards. Other areas that we look at for wellness policies can be found on a tool that we call Does Your Wellness Policy Measure Up? This can be found right on our website. Just go to Programs, National School Lunch Program, and as you scroll down on that page, you will see a section for local wellness policy. You can download that form and self-check your wellness policy prior to us coming, coming in for an administrative review. Maine School Management Association does have a compliance sample policy if you need some help getting started. Professional standards are required annual training hours. Guidelines have been set by USDA to determine how many hours each child nutrition employee must receive. Directors must have 12 hours of training. Managers are required to have 10. Staff members that work 20 or more hours a week need six hours of training, and part-time staff are under 20 hours a week are required to have four hours of training annually. When it comes to the job titles that are associated with training hours, it is important to remember that even if you do not have the title of director or manager, for instance, if you perform those duties, you are required to meet the higher amount of training hours. If staff outside of the nutrition program have duties within the program, they must be trained on their specific duties as well. As part of professional standards, um, civil rights training must be completed every year. If you have members of your school that do not work for the nutrition program but assist with duties within it, they must be trained on their specific duties like stated before and they must also receive our civil rights training. Um, for example, if you have either a secretary or a principal in your school that does application approval, it is required that they receive our annual civil rights training. The non-discrimination statement is another area where we tend to see problems. The full non-discrimination statement needs to be on all program materials. We do allow for the short statement, this institution is an equal opportunity provider, on program menus. Permission to use the short statement on any other program materials can only be given by Walter Beasley. Often we find that the non-discrimination statement being used is not the most current. Um, we have also been seeing lately that a lot of program materials are lacking the main non-discrimination statement. This is important to have because in Maine there are additional protected classes. 
Best practice is to make sure to update all program materials before the start of each school year. The current federal and state non-discrimination statement are available on our website. Here on this slide, I have the full federal and state non-discrimination statement pulled directly from our website. Um, feel free to definitely go and check our website and compare it to the ones you have on your program materials at any time. Another finding that we're seeing right now is meal charge policies. These are a requirement for every program within the National School Lunch Program. We frequently see that old or outdated policies refer to serving an alternate meal when students um, reach a specific balance. Um, but in the state of Maine, due to the passing of LD-167 or ensuring student access to meals, this is no longer allowable language for your meal charge policies. Um, your meal charge policy should clearly communicate with families the steps that your school or district will take to collect any debts that are incurred. Your meal charge policy should also clearly communicate what is allowed to be charged and what cannot be charged. Because of the passing of in the Ensuring Student Access to Meals um, law, reimbursable meals must be allowed to be charged. Um, a la carte items, best practice is to not allow them to be charged. Uh, if your school or district allows this, there needs to be a policy in place to account for how those charges will be covered if a family chooses not to pay. Um, bad meal debt is not allowed to be covered by the nutrition account. During the administrative review process, we will look through your kitchen and evaluate your food safety practices. It is required that all schools have a standard operating procedures or SOPs available for review. When we are in the school, we will ask to see your SOPs. We will look to see if they have been customized to meet the needs of your school, and we will also look to see when the last time they were reviewed was. After reviewing your SOPs, we will spot check some of them to see if you are truly following what you say you are. We may look at your personal hygiene policy, for example, to see if you're following your own rules about jewelry or fingernails. The next food safety we will, item we will look at is your thermometer calibration. It is required that you are calibrating, or in the case of digital thermometers, checking for calibration um, at a minimum of once a week. This needs to be recorded either on a thermometer calibration log or you can even record it on your production record, whichever is easier for you. But if it is not documented, we have to assume that it is not being done. When we first walk into your school or cafeteria, we are looking around for the required signage. We should be able to find the And Justice for All poster, your health inspection, and your signs that explain what constitutes a reimbursable meal. The And Justice for All poster and the health inspection both need to be posted in public view. This means that anyone that comes into your serving area can walk up and read them. A common place we see them is in the kitchen, visible from the serving area. This is not acceptable though, because people cannot walk up to it and read the information on the sign. Reimbursable meal signage for both breakfast and lunch need to be at the beginning of the serving line. They must also indicate the half a cup fruit or vegetable requirement for the reimbursable meal. Another piece of signage that we find missing sometimes is a list of calories for a la carte items. Calories for a la carte items must be posted at the point of decision. If you have vending machines, it needs to be on the machine. If you have an ice cream cooler, uh, ice cream cooler, chip rack, or anything along those lines, calories for those items need to be posted as well. So next we are gonna talk about FSVP claiming. So if you are a part of the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, we are seeing some struggles with schools um, being able to spend all of their 
fresh fruit and vegetable grants. Here we have a few tips to help you try and stay on top of your spending. Um, the most recommended tip we have is creating your own monthly budget for FFEP. This way you know how much you can or need to spend e each month to use your entire grant, but also not run out before the end of it. Be sure to check the usage report throughout the year to ensure that you are staying on track um, to being able to spend all of your grant. Um, remember that labor associated with FFVP can be claimed and also 10% of your FFVP can be used for applicable administrative costs. Um, if you are not spending all of your money, this can negatively affect future FSVP awards. Uh, if you have any questions in regards to FSVP, be sure to contact Stephanie Stombuck and she can assist you with anything you need. One thing that we also see that we know that schools sometimes forget about is summer food service program outreach. Um, during the school year, thinking about the Summer Food Service Program isn't always at the front of our mind. However, when we are performing an administrative review, we will ask you about your Summer Food Service Program outreach. Even if you do not operate a Summer Food Service Program yourself, you are still required to provide families with the information um, about either local Summer Food Service Programs or how to find a Summer Food Service Program. This can easily be achieved by putting an ad on your June menu directing families to one of the many websites that offer resources for finding summer meals. A few of these websites are 211main.org, mealsforkids.org, um, or even through the USDA directly. I hope that everyone has been able to take something away from today's webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at my email address listed on this slide here. Um, if you registered for this webinar and are watching it live, a certificate will be emailed to you. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful day.